machine learning is rapidly making significant contributions to several facets of society, from robotics to virtual assistants and product recommendations, and even how YouTube gets your interest right, but also takes you to videos that you would never search for in a million years. But it also has incredible applications for the science community when it comes to processing data once it's been downlinked, and perhaps even processing data on a spacecraft. And as we'll come to find in this episode, applying machine learning algorithms to these applications allows scientific analysis to become much more efficient and therefore have a greater impact, not just in planetary science, but also in industries which impact our lives every day. And with that, welcome to another episode of The Art of Space Engineering. I'm your host, Sarah Rogers, and in today's episode, I got the chance to sit down with Dr. Hannah Kerner to explore what goes into machine learning for planetary science and what challenges and limitations arise from applying machine learning algorithms both on the ground and on a spacecraft. Dr. Kerner earned her PhD in systems exploration design from ASU, and through this was able to do some really neat work involving novelty detection methods within machine learning, specifically focusing on how these algorithms could be harnessed on board the Mars Curiosity rover to extract information from datasets which could then inform meaningful scientific observations much more efficiently. In the past, she's worked for Planet Labs, developing software for their famous dev CubeSats, which image the Earth every day, and has also spent some time at JPL and NASA Langley. She's now an assistant professor at the University of Maryland, where she is working with NASA Harvest to apply machine learning solutions in remote sensing, which we'll talk much more about in this interview. While machine learning has grown to be a pretty big topic over the years, it was a subject that I knew very little about. So this was a really fun conversation to have, and a really neat way to just see how this allows science and engineering to blend together. And two, that the space industry has really blossomed into several different directions over the years, and there are more ways to get involved in space than, say, being an astronaut, or being an astrophysicist, or developing a spacecraft. So this was also a really great way to show a different side of space exploration that people don't normally think about. So. Without further ado, let's explore what machine learning has to offer. How are you? How are things going? Good. How about you? Pretty good. Yeah, hanging in there. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is a podcast, right? So it's not video. It's just audio mm -hmm. okay yes me sure yes, i've been doing all of these at home in yoga pants so yeah. we're good yeah <laughs> new uniform yeah <laughs> this is my podcast uniform i love it okay so oh, cool uh yeah let's go ahead and get started i guess if if you're ready yeah sweet uh so i i I figure we could just kind of start this out by getting to know a little bit more about you and your background. Um, so why don't we just start off with talking about where you are now and what you do and how you how you got to uh, the University of Maryland, right? That's where you are now. Yeah, yeah. So I'm currently an assistant research professor at the University of Maryland in College Park. And what I, I'm actually in the geographical sciences department there. Um, but what my research is, is using machine learning with remote sensing or satellite data to monitor agriculture and food security. So I, I work under this program called NASA Harvest, um, which has the goal of increasing the use of satellite data in decision-making related to agriculture and food security. I know one thing that you're also involved in is Girls Who Code. Um, I don't know a whole lot of about that, but can you talk a little bit about what that program is and then how you're involved in it? Sure. So um, Girls Who Code is a nationwide, it might even be a global program um, that tries to, you know, as the name says, teach girls how to code. <laughs> um, and, and so I was really involved in that uh, in Arizona during my PhD, where I worked with um, middle school girls at heard uh, elementary and middle school in downtown Phoenix. Um, and so I, I worked with them for about four years, um, teaching them how to program, 
um, in a variety of, of languages, but also just to you know, think about problems in a way that we do in computer science and to talk with them about the opportunities that exist for them in computer science. Um, much like them, I also, you know, didn't know anybody in computer science, certainly when I was in middle school, and really not until um, just before college when I did an internship at uh, NASA Langley with a computer scientist. And so a lot of what we did too was to just talk about what it means to be a computer scientist in the world and how many different things you can do using computer science. Very cool. Yeah, I wish, um, looking back now, because I didn't really do like a whole lot of, um, I don't know, I wasn't involved in like engineering clubs or anything in high school. So like this is, it's really cool that they have organizations like this for, for girls and, and for especially young girls too. So. Yeah, I mean, it relies so much on there being people willing to volunteer to, to teach those courses. Um, and so to me, it was something that was super important and let me, you know, branch out beyond what I was doing at ASU and in my research community. Um, and it's, it's really fun to learn from them about how they think about problems and see the different things they're interested in. So, I mean, I think there's probably a lot of people who often think, oh, I'd like to get involved in something like that. And it really is as easy as like going to the website and looking up <laughs> what the closest school that has a club <laughs> is to you, you know? So for anyone listening, <laughs> I strongly encourage you to just, just act on it if you're thinking about doing something like that. Yeah, absolutely. That's really good advice. Um, so what kind of got you into the space industry in the first place? Um, so I was really interested in space initially uh, in astrophysics. And um, then when I discovered computer science, uh, which I loved, I switched to that. And um, sort of the most obvious way at the time to be involved in computer science and space was through uh, flight software or embedded software. And I was also really interested in robotics. So that was kind of the, the part of space that I was focused on. Um, but I got really interested in this commercial space industry as opposed to more like government contractor or government um, pathways to space because uh, there were so much more opportunities for you to make an impact or actually work on, um, on real missions in the space industry compared to, uh, you know, NASA doing amazing things, uh, but their projects are much, much bigger, right? And so to work on uh, as a flight software engineer on Landsat or these, these right. huge flagship missions, you know, um, it's, there probably aren't as many opportunities when you're fresh out of college. Um, it's certainly not opportunities to, you know, play a key role in that. Um, but in the space industry, um, there certainly was. And so that's why I was interested in finding a role there. Yeah, I would um, definitely second that. <laughs> that is a very good point. It's definitely, um, I see a lot of students too, like are try are navigating more towards like the smaller companies or, you know, it's, it's not the easiest thing for them to get involved in these flagship missions because you, you do need that seniority. So yeah, that is, that's important. I want to transition kind of from this into more of like your, your PhD work, because it's, it's really interesting. And it's something that I, I like knew nothing about until um, I, I started looking into it more for this interview, actually. So, so coming out of college, you first you did some work at Planet on, on their, their flight software, but now you're a user of Planet Data for NASA Harvest. So, but more in the machine learning aspect instead of like developing the actual flight software that the CubeSats are using to take all of these photos. So how now do you utilize these images to actually, and, and machine learning techniques to actually study these, these changes in agriculture over time? So when I was at Planet and doing flight software, you know, I would, I would be writing the sort of code that would 
um, for example, create a driver for a new sensor that was on on the satellite. Like a, we have a new magnetometer and we need to write the code to link that into the rest of the system or um, you know, we need to convert our system into a real-time operating system or things like this. Um, you know, the code that actually runs the satellite tells it to take pictures, how to store things, um, how to monitor the temperatures or other sensors on the satellite. But, you know, meanwhile, these satellites are taking these amazing images and that was much earlier when I was there. So we weren't quite at the goal that the company had yet of acquiring uh, basically three meter resolution images of the earth every single day. Um, but now they have reached that. And so there's this you know, amazing massive data set uh, that's being collected. And I was really interested in being on the other side um, of the spacecraft and starting to develop software to look at this amazing data that not just the doves were collecting, but other spacecraft uh, like the Mars rovers um, and try to extract insights from those uh, data in order to help move forward scientific discovery, essentially. Um, and, and so that's really how I transitioned into the machine learning side of things and, and analyzing the satellite data that was collected. Um, and so I, I focused more on Mars spacecraft and data during my PhD uh, and a little bit of Earth, but now I've sort of flipped that script um, after my PhD now at, at UMD, where I, uh, I still have a little bit of Mars work, but the vast majority of, of my work is looking at Earth. And, um, and what we're doing with that is to look at these observations that are being acquired by not just the planet satellites, but all these different satellites like Landsat or Sentinel-2 or, you know, other satellites that measure different properties of the electromagnetic spectrum. And we use machine learning to, to parse out of this massive amount of just signal and noise um, what these key measurements are or, or characteristics that we want to know about the, the surface of the earth where cropland is. So this includes like where are specific crops planted, what is the condition of those crops, how are the crops being impacted by uh, disease, for example, or natural disasters like flooding or the derecho that hit Iowa last week. Um, and we work with uh, national ministries of agriculture and governments to help develop programs that, uh, where they can use the insights generated by the machine learning models with the satellite data uh, to help inform their decision making about um, crop insurance, subsidies during COVID-19, to farmers, um, you know, what their food budget is, how much food a country has. Um, and we also inform commodities markets uh, to help stabilize prices and market activities when there's uncertainty. Um, you know, really broad range of, um, of things that are enabled by this combination of machine learning and satellite data. So like you were saying, all, all of, like there's this massive amount of data that scientists have to to process and and machine learning can really add a lot more depth to that and so i i was curious i was interested to to go into a little bit more depth on that topic with you and discuss what sort of benefits exactly does machine learning kind of provide for like planetary science analysis or just earth analysis um, as you're extracting all of this data from from images or even um, just using machine learning on spacecraft as well to to actually process this on board instead of doing it on the ground well i think the the benefits of machine learning are a little bit different um, for planetary science or planetary exploration and um, spacecraft exploration than they are for um, kind of geography and earth science applications, mainly because 
we have so much more data for Earth than other planets. You know, Planet, for example, Planet Labs is imaging the entire Earth every single day at three meter resolution, which is just like, you know, petabytes of data. It's a massive amount of data. And they're only one player in this massive uh, landscape of Earth observation, right? We have Landsat images everywhere every 16 days. We have Sentinel-2 images every five days. We have Sentinel-1 radar images. We have uh, MODIS images. We have VIRS. There are so many um, Earth observing satellites and really that uh, that suite of sensors orbiting the Earth is growing all the time. And so really what machine learning enables is the ability to even start to take advantage <laughs> of these data. Um, you know, if you imagine if you need a map of all of the cropland in a country, how can you get that without machine learning? You know, you would have to somehow automate that. There's no way that a, a human can go through and identify every single pixel of cropland in a 10 meter resolution images. You know, it's millions of pixels. Um, and to do that every year, like this just becomes an intractable problem to do manually. So you have to have machine learning. And, uh, you know, you could imagine one way, sort of a similar way of automating these kinds of things is just coming up with uh, rule-based classifiers. Like, okay, if it's this green, then it's not a building. You know, you could come <laughs> up with these, these declarative rules for, for classifying things. And that's what was done for a really long time. Um, however, we're increasingly uh, leveraging developments from machine learning that are methods like deep neural networks or deep learning, which many people have probably heard about by now, um, that rather than us as programmers telling the computer what patterns to look for, we basically set up the computer to find those patterns on its own. And so this is uh, much more powerful and results in much more generalizable patterns that are learned uh, because these are, it, it's learning so many patterns that we can't even begin to come up with. You know, essentially they're learning um, uh, nonlinear nested composed functions that are, have millions of variables. <laughs> you know, this is way beyond mx plus b which is sort of like more tractable um, for humans to think about and visualize like we're not good at thinking about or visualizing data in millions of dimensions you know we can we can reason pretty well about like an rgb image maybe um, but a lot of what humans even think about in our own pattern recognition in our brains is not uh, rules that are easily distilled, right? You might look at, you can, you've seen a million examples of cats versus dogs. You can tell them apart. But if I asked you like exactly why, you know, you, you might be like, well, um, <laughs> like cats have pointier ears. Oh, but some dogs have pointy ears too. You know, it's, it's really difficult to come up with like this full uh, declarative rule-based approach uh, for, for separating different classes of objects. Um, you know, not just for cats versus dogs, but for corn versus soybeans and, and all kinds of other things. And so um, that's really what machine learning enables us to do. Um, and, and, and that's true for, for everything in machine learning, not just earth science, but this, um, you know, the amount of data we have in planetary science is a lot more tractable um, for people to analyze. And, you know, change detection, for example, is largely done manually. Crater counting is largely done manually um, for, uh, for planetary science studies. 
Um, but we, what we can do with machine learning is, is not just automating these kinds of mundane tasks, but we can basically aid scientists in their discovery. We can help them identify uh, features or geology that are interesting to them um, or maybe that they would have missed because it's difficult to analyze multiple streams of data or just multispectral data um, with our, our lower dimensionally <laughs> reasoning minds. Um, and, and so I think with, for planetary science, there's of course like this benefit from automation, but what we also get is like new insights from our data. Very cool. That's, that's awesome. I love this. Um, so you, one thing that I was curious about too is, so you mentioned one thing that we try to distinguish is, is all of these different planetary features. And so I was curious just to understand what challenges come when you're actually trying to implement all of these different machine learning methods along the way. Yeah, uh, many, <laughs> many challenges. Mm -hmm. And um, again, like depending on the problem that you're looking at, uh, and especially if you're looking at Earth versus Mars, for example, there are very different challenges. I remember like before I started working primarily on Earth, I would tell the Earth people, oh, Mars has clouds too, but no, no, <laughs> it, is, it is so different. There are so, so many clouds on Earth and, you know, that on its own is a big challenge. Um, it's how to deal with all these different kinds of noise. And, and in any planet, any real world machine learning problem, really, what's difficult is, uh, one source of difficulty is kind of separating the signal from the noise. Um, which the model can do to an extent, but often there are some patterns to this noise that you also want to ignore. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of data wrangling that goes into just getting uh, these remote sensing data or scientific data products into a format that is suitable for machine learning. And then even just inspecting what the model has learned or what the outputs are can be difficult when you're working uh, on like really large scale data or geographic data. Um, you know, you might inspect like your model outputs in a GIS tool like JMARS or QGIS or ArcGIS, uh, which is not something that you need to do when you're classifying cats and dogs mm -hmm. or, or these kind of more traditional computer vision tasks. Um, so I think there's a lot that goes into just like doing real world applications with scientific data products and uh, creating them in a way that's useful for the real end users who you're creating them for, the scientists or even the general public. Um, and then I think particularly for science, there's really a range of uh, data challenges that you'd have and really that control the kind of method you use based on how much data you have at that planet. You know, we have, I don't know, a handful of images of Pluto, right? And so what you might be able to do for Pluto is very different than, for example, the moon, where we have a huge record of images from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter camera um, over many years. And so, so you, you, mentioned that you know one of the more important things is is, is trying to allow scientists to actu actually like look at all of this in a feasible way but are there any i know like sometimes it's it's very difficult to actually um automate a process and so some of it does have to be done manually um are there any limitations to implementing machine learning or um does it is it has technology evolved to a, a stage where it can pretty much do everything and you just kind of need to figure out how? Um, yes and no. <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. there, there are all kinds of challenges associated with like actually making something work or finding the data that you need. Um, I think in general, when people ask me, hey, can machine learning do X? You know, I get this question a lot. Like, suppose I want to find this thing and this data set, 
Um, do you think machine learning could do that? And in general, my answer is, if you can do it, then it's likely there's a way for machine learning to do it or for us to do it with machine learning. Uh, you know, there's, there's nothing in principle that is preventing us from doing that. Um, however, you might have a situation where, you know, you don't have enough data, labeled data or not, you know, you just don't have enough data at all to really pick up on a general pattern. And so, you know, maybe the solution is something other than machine learning. You know, machine learning shouldn't be used for every single problem. It, there probably are many problems that it doesn't make sense to use machine learning for. But um, often what we have to do is think about the problems in a creative way or think about how we can use other data sets that may not be um, you know, exactly what you need, but can still provide the model with useful information um, in order to still learn these concepts. So one example of that is uh, for uh, predicting where, where crops are in a country where we have really sparse labeled data, like um, in a project we worked on in Togo in West Africa recently, there was no available labeled data for where crops were in, in Togo for us to train the model. But what we could do was use information from where crops are grown other places to help the model learn, um, learn what crops look like in general, and then to help, you know, provide very few examples of what that looks like in Togo to then have the model kind of specialize and adapt more quickly uh, to the specific patterns in that area. That's really cool. How long does it actually take for models to recognize crops like that? Um, so models learn in basically steps of, of input data. And so um, depending on what, well, that's for neural networks. I mainly work with neural networks, but um, there are many other types of models uh, like random forests are really popular or support vector machines or all kinds of models you can use. Um, but, it, you know, we, we really think not so much in terms of time, but in terms of examples, like mm -hmm. how many examples do I need to show this model for it to learn uh, what's going on. And typically for neural networks, that number is in like the thousands to tens of thousands. Um, but for, uh, for other models, it might be, it might require fewer labels, but, um, really what determines how many examples you need at, is how separable the classes you want to predict are. So it, it might require very few examples for you to tell the difference between, um, water and forests because these look very different spectrally and spatially. There's a lot of differences. Um, and, however, it might take a lot more time to separate something that looks much more similar. Um, like, for example, I said more time, but again, I mean more examples mm -hmm. um, to separate really similar things like maize versus maize that's intercropped with another crop. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, it's really about like the entanglement of those classes in the n-dimensional space <laughs> <laughs> that our data live in. Um, and so uh, to some extent, knowing how many examples you need for something like that is heuristic. Um, but there are also many ways that we try to find to, like I said, uh, leverage other kinds of data um, to, to help reduce the number of labels we need to be able to get these really accurate models. Gotcha. Makes sense. Um, so, so there's, there's processing on the ground and then, um, I know like your PhD work focused on processing for, for, um, curiosity. Is there a huge difference between implementing machine learning on spacecraft, which actually 
it, it need to use this in order to determine maybe what kind of scientific observation to make next versus uh, doing this after the fact, after it's been downlinked and, and now you're looking at all of this data and trying to extract out stuff from it. Yeah, definitely. I would say, I mean, I can give an example of exactly that where we're doing uh, what's called novelty detection or automatically identifying novel features in, uh, in a, a data point, um, in our case, images uh, from MassCam and from NavCam uh, on the Mars rover where like the, the biggest difference I would say is your compute requirements. Mm -hmm. So on board, particularly on the Mars rover, the Mars rover has a Rad 750, um, which I don't remember exactly how much um, memory it has or what the processor speed is, but it's, um, it's very, very limited compared to what we have available on the ground. On the ground, I can use as many GPUs as I want. You know, we definitely don't have a GPU on the Mars rover. And so really like the choice of methods that you can work with are more limited. Um, as well as, you know, how much data you can store to keep using those methods uh, or making your predictions. I can store as much data as I want on the ground. On board the spacecraft, we have a very limited amount of space, especially that's going to be allocated to a machine learning algorithm. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think the other biggest difference is the stakes. So if, if the model makes a mistake, the stakes are much higher uh, on board than they are on the ground. You know, if I'm if I have a model that recommends to a scientist, hey, you might want to look at this image, um, and they're like, this image is crap. Why did you show me this? <laughs> That's where it ends. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like maybe it starts. Maybe the scientist starts to get annoyed <laughs> with the model or things like you know. There definitely there are definitely uh, consequences to malfunctioning algorithms uh, or poor performance on the ground. But on board, this could mean like you are using up way too much memory and you cause an issue with some other processes, or it could mean that you're wasting spacecraft uh, time and resources uh, that are, you know, really tightly rationed to begin with. Um, and so it requires a lot more like prior planning uh, and testing and simulation and, and all kinds of things um, and convincing of others uh, of the validity of your approach than, than for the ground where the stakes are much lower. That's fair. I guess, because I think like when you think of, you know, spacecraft are so far away and you, you only have so many uplink and downlink opportunities per day, like it seems really like this seems amazing. Um, it seems like you could get so much more data out of it, but yeah, you're right. When you think of like how much memory it takes up and, and processing and yeah, there's definitely several examples where um, uh, from, from previous missions where like all this complex processing has caused an issue on the spacecraft and you know, like the computer rebooted and oh, now we have an issue. What do we do? Um, right. So yeah, right. that's important to think about. Um, Oh, is one one thing I was curious about too is that are are algorithms and or, or methods different for different kind of like planetary surfaces or like looking at crops versus looking at rocky areas? Um, yeah, um, they they are not, and they're also not different than looking at like your face versus your friend's face in a Facebook image, right? You know, we, we use, I use the same kinds of methods um, that I use in my Mars work for, uh, for Earth-based work or agricultural monitoring. And these are the same methods that people at Facebook are using. Um, and, you know, there's, in many cases, like there's different data types and, you know, might not even be image data. There's all kinds of um, these other differences, but in general, like these methods are very transferable. Uh, I mean, this is why I was able to go directly from working on primarily Mars to Earth with very little uh, kind of transition time. Mm -hmm. And I could go work on Facebook images <laughs> if I wanted to <laughs> also. 
with with very little transition. Nice. So throughout all of your work, uh, what have been some of like the biggest lessons learned that you've discovered along the way? either related to bars, um, and it could be technical, it can be like working with people, maybe as you did your PhD. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, um, I think the biggest lesson is that you, you can't work on these problems if you want to make a real impact in another domain, like I am using machine learning, but trying to make an impact in planetary science, um, or agriculture, food security, earth science, um, whatever it is, you can't do that by yourself. And you can't do that with just computer scientists. You know, I think there's a, a lot of attitudes in, um, in tech that are sort of like, here, I've brought the machine learning, I've brought the tech, I'm going to solve all your problems, you know, and this really leads to a lot of like, um disappointment <laughs> by the the stakeholders when you know often this ends up in systems being created that are not even solving the problem that the domain experts wanted solved in the first place or you know they're essentially like optimizing the wrong target or um they just don't work very well because they weren't tested under realistic circumstances, right? So if I was only testing my novelty detection methods for looking at, for uh, prioritizing which mass cam images the science team might want to look at every downlink, if I was doing that based on only like pure computer vision or machine learning metrics like accuracy or, you know, these different kind of standard metrics, I probably wouldn't end up with a useful product for that science team to use. But what's really critical is to form teams, even if they're just two people, uh, that are interdisciplinary and, you know, computer scientists working directly alongside uh, planetary scientists or agricultural experts, farmers even, or, um, you know, decision makers. Uh, in order to create these systems that are really beneficial and that work really well. Um, and, and that's something that I've been able to do um, both at ASU and, and at UMD. Um, and, and I think that's just so critical um, in, in every project. Oh yeah, definitely. I, I, wish, I wish we had more opportunities like that within at least like the educational setting, but you really don't get those unless you, depending on what project you join and if it has to have science in it, so. Yeah, I think something I didn't appreciate um, until I left ASU and the School of Earth and Space Exploration was like how effective that model was of having all of these different disciplines that are related in this umbrella of Earth and Space Exploration um really like all together in the same building you know and and being able to do a phd program that was really um intended from the beginning to be this interdisciplinary um research approach um you know that's i think it's something that many institutions are trying to learn how to do mm -hmm. that cc does very well yeah i would agree yeah that's that's probably one of the reasons why I've really appreciated CC um, over the the time that I've been here. That's a good point. Yeah, it makes a difference when you have to walk, you know, all the way across campus to meet <laughs> right. with your collaborator who's who's in the domain you're working with. So um, now we're all remote, so yeah. we can just call. <laughs> That's true. Everyone see, yeah, everyone seems like they're right here now. <laughs> exactly. Um, so, so we've, we've talked about, uh, like unsupervised methods for, for machine learning, but are there any cases with planetary science where maybe supervised, uh, learning methods would be better? Yeah, definitely. Um, a lot of what I've worked on is unsupervised learning, mainly because, you know, we're trying, a lot of my work in planetary science was 
in novelty detection. And if you don't know what's novel, mm -hmm. you can't label something as novel. And uh, however, there are a huge number of supervised problems in planetary science that, um, you know, are, are really important. I mean, I think the most obvious example that probably most planetary scientists would identify with and understand is like crater counting or crater detection. Um, you know, you have a, a whole image, you want to draw a circle around every crater in that image. That is a supervised machine learning problem. It actually blows my mind. I, I couldn't believe it when I started grad school and learned that people were not doing that in an automated way. <laughs> um, that was super confusing to me. Um, and but now you know people people are working on um, there. There are many groups doing um, supervised object detection or classification of craters. Um, and yeah, I did a project too where. Um, we were identifying recurring slope linear uh, or these features that are um, kind of crawling down the walls of craters, usually on Mars. Uh, and these kinds of like mapping tasks or feature identification tasks are, um, are really good for supervised machine learning, assuming you have uh, a lot of examples of those. It might be harder to detect something that you've only seen once. And so, you know, for example, finding uh, dust devils, like the actual dust devil, not just the tracks. Right. There are very few images of that. Something like novelty detection is probably much better suited for that because you're looking really for a rare event um, versus identifying dust devil tracks, which we have many examples of and you can do with a supervised classifier. Gotcha. Okay. So to kind of circle way back. <laughs> um, so your educational path was was a bit different in the sense that you got your bachelor's and then you worked for a little bit and then you came back and got a PhD. So uh, I was curious to ask why why your path kind of gravitated that way and, and what got you back to um, going towards a, a higher degree in the first place. Yeah, I think when I um, when I finished undergrad, I was really ready to like get out there and experience new things. And um, you know, when I started working uh, at Planet Labs, like working there was super exciting. But also just like living in San Francisco with other young people was really exciting. I was learning about so many different things, including machine learning, which was having sort of like a new renaissance at the time um, with deep learning. And, you know, there was just like so much more to experience um, after I finished college um, that I, I really wasn't ready to like go back to school for, for many years. And, um, and then after a while when I was working, then I started to feel like, you know, I really wanted a brain upgrade, essentially. Mm -hmm. I felt like you know, this is great what I'm doing, but you're, when you're working at a company, you know, you have, you have tasks that need to be done to meet a schedule. You have customers that you have to deliver your product to. Um, all of these things are somewhat at odds with like thinking really long and deeply about uh, a particular topic. Um, and so I really wanted to have the ability to just think for a really long time um, and to explore topics in a level of depth that was really difficult to do when you're in this more like fast pace, uh, ship it <laughs> environment. Um, and so, yeah, so that's why, that's why I left to go to my PhD. No, I, I can definitely resonate with that too. <laughs> yeah. Um... I never saw myself as doing a PhD, but it's definitely, it was one of the reasons why I at least wanted to stay for a master's was to like focus on a topic and, and learn it. So yeah, I, mm -hmm. um, I can agree with that. Yeah, and I'm glad I did because what I would have thought I would do during my PhD, if I were to do a PhD, leaving undergrad is, is quite different than what I do now. You know, mm -hmm. so I was focused much more on robotics and path planning and embedded systems and real time operating systems um, versus now I'm much more focused on data science, machine learning, AI. Um, and I don't, I don't know if I would have found that same 
uh, path if I had gone straight into a PhD. Yeah, that's a good point. Kind of going off of that, is there any advice that you would give students now who are, who are thinking about researching machine learning more, maybe resources that they might want to want to read? Um, yeah, it, there are lots of great resources out there for just like machine learning in general. If you're interested in learning about machine learning, Google has a crash course in machine learning, um, which has a lot of really fun interactive plots that help you understand better what all these different parts of the models are doing. Um, there are several good Coursera courses that are free, um, which I also took when I was learning machine learning. Um, and uh, those are by like really the top machine learning um, researchers like Andrew Ng or Jeff Hinton. Um, and so those, those are great resources. There are also some really good survey papers out there now. Um, particularly, there's a nature, uh, a nature article called Deep Learning. Um, that's a great uh, introduction to what deep learning is and why it's become so popular. Uh, that was, came out in 2015, which seems so long ago in, in deep learning. <laughs> yeah. um, like the, the pace is so much faster than in other areas of science. It's crazy. Hmm. Uh, but yeah, there, there are many good resources like that. And really, there are just a ton of great YouTube videos. Um, I really like a YouTube channel called Three Blue, One Brown, uh, which has a lot oh, of great yeah. videos. Yeah, um, maybe it's Three Brown, One Blue. I think it's Three Blue, One Brown. Yeah, uh, yeah about uh, not just machine learning, but like probability and other mathematical concepts um, that I, I really recommend. So I was looking into this. Are you writing a book on this too for planetary science? Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Yes. When, when can I read this? Because this sounds awesome. <laughs> yeah. Um, so this book, Machine Learning for Planetary Science, it is going to come out early 2021. So it's it's been taking a bit longer than we originally planned. Um, a lot of delays during COVID. Of course, it comes much more difficult for people to write long chapters uh, yeah. during, during the pandemic. Um, so that, yeah, that will come out early 2021. Um, we're working really hard to finish it um, in the next few months so that it can be all, you know, packaged up by the end of the year uh, and, and ready for, for all of you in 2021. <laughs> Very cool. And is that just going to cover, um techniques that like computer scientists can use in order to implement machine learning or is it also more of like a guide for planetary scientists as well? Yeah so it's meant to be a bridge really between the machine learning and planetary science communities so there's um, both an introduction to machine learning uh, in the context of planetary science so giving like planetary science specific examples uh, and talking about the kinds of methods that are um, would be, you know, most frequently used in planetary science. Uh, but there's also an introduction to uh, planetary exploration systems and planetary data systems and data products um, that I think would be useful for many planetary scientists as well, but certainly for computer scientists because um, you know, the, it, it's not like you can just download a bunch of JPEGs or PNGs for planetary science data. There are all these different formats that computer scientists aren't used to working with. And, um, you know, it's, it can be difficult for an outsider to learn how to compile these data sets from the planetary data system, for example. Um, so there's that introduction as well. Uh, and then we also have um, a lot of case studies in there that we have sort of picked to span a bunch of different uh, problems and planets and data types in uh, planetary science using machine learning. So there's uh, a case study with Jupiter, there's a case study with asteroids, Mercury, Mars, uh, the moon, and uh, not just image data, but other kinds of data as well. 
Um, and we have some tutorials in there too. So for example, like how do you create a data set from the PDS and label your data? Um, you know, if I want to annotate where the craters are so that I can train a model, how should I do that? Mm -hmm. um, that's kind of what we're trying to, to capture in the book. Awesome. That's really cool. I'll uh, have to look for that when it, when it yeah. early 2021. <laughs> um, so I, I have one last question and it's, it's one that I, I like to ask everybody. Um, but do you have a favorite story it can be related to machine learning, can be related to anything else, uh, that you would like to share? Um, yeah, I can give, I'll give one maybe silly example and okay. one more real world impact example. Um, so the, the silly one I would give that a lot of people like to hear is from, uh, when I was at Planet Labs and then it was a, a very small company. It was like 40 people when I joined, I think. And, um, so there was a lot of like silliness that went on in addition to uh, our, our constant hard work on these spacecraft. But um, one thing that the mission operations team did was to uh, create a YO account for the Dove satellites where YO is this app. I don't even know if it exists anymore, honestly, but it literally you would just friend people and send them YO. <laughs> like I could send you like yo and your phone would go yo. That's all it did. <laughs> and and so they set up a yo account for the dubs so that when they were deployed uh, and you had uh, followed space dubs, you would get a yo on your phone. So you know the the satellites would come online and our phones would go yo. Um, and one time I was woken up by my phone going yo yo like in the middle of the night and i'm like what is going on you weren't <laughs> supposed to have these satellites deployed and and others had this this same experience you know we're all like what the heck happened and the next day we find out it's because the deployers on the iss had prematurely deployed the satellites oh, um this yeah. is probably in I think, 2014 <laughs> so uh, yeah, that wasn't supposed to happen, but we found out before the deployer uh, talked to us about it because the satellite sent us a yo when they came <laughs> online. That's great. Um, yeah, so that's a pretty <laughs> unexpected usefulness of, mm -hmm. you know, silly Easter eggs that you implement in your company. Um, and then, yeah, I guess the other, like, more more serious one would be um, to just tell this story of a project we recently completed. Um, again, when I mentioned Togo in West Africa, um, where basically the government had reached out to us asking, you know, do you have a map of cropland in Togo, a high resolution one, like we really need to know where all of our smallholder farms are located because uh, we want to distribute COVID-related aid to help boost uh, food production um, for individual farmers. So they wanted to basically disperse money to their digital wallets, depending on um, like the density of these small farms uh, throughout the country. And this didn't already exist. Um, and so we were like, I mean, yeah, we could, we could make this. And they're like, okay, great. Could you do it by Friday? And it's like Monday. <laughs> oh my gosh. It. So, you know, we were like, oh my God, okay, let's do it. You know, and, and we really had this crazy relay race of putting together this model and testing it and producing this map of an entire African country, uh, at 10 meter resolution, um, in like, under 10 days uh, from the ask to this final product, um, you know, down to like one of uh, the people on my team was in Malaysia, they're just 12 hours ahead of me. So we would be like passing things back and forth. Um, when I would go to bed, he'd be starting his day and we were really just like working 24 hours a day for this mm -hmm. period in this like relay race of, of method development. Um, but we were able to do it and we delivered this map to them that they were able to actually use 
to um, determine where to distribute aid and help out these farmers um, during the pandemic. And so for me, I think that's just a really good example of how powerful uh, coding is and, and satellite data is that, you know, from our homes, we didn't go anywhere, you know, we were on, on lockdown. We could make this, this huge impact uh, in, in somewhere, you know, on the other side of the world. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my, my other story. I love that. Yeah, no, that's, that's a, a perfect example of, uh, just like how the aerospace industry can impact everyday life. Like that's, um, that's definitely one of the things that made me fall in love with aerospace in the, in the first place was, you know, you, you can just do so much for people every day that you can't do, um, easily just on the ground, um, or really by any other means. So I, that's awesome. Yeah, I think people really don't realize like how pervasive satellites are in their their daily lives. You know, mm -hmm. not just from a GPS as an example that's used all the time, or you might know that you're getting your Wi-Fi on the airplane from satellites, but you know, we don't usually think about the fact that like Lando Lakes Butter has a, a remote <laughs> satellite analysis team right um and, and that like it, it goes into like so many decisions behind what we eat even mm -hmm. yeah that's great and um i think that's that's a beautiful end to the episode as well but yeah thank you so so much for doing this with me this is this was awesome and i, I definitely learned about a lot about a topic that i i knew nothing about <laughs> as an aerospace major so i appreciate it this is awesome Great. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. That really is a beautiful way to conclude this episode. I, I love the story about the dove sending a yo from space. Like, spacecraft beacons are just the coolest way to send fun messages like that, or just troll on people who wouldn't be expecting it. Like, I keep waiting for someone to add a feature on their CubeSat that just transmits a text file with the lyrics to, like, Never Gonna Give You Up by Rick Astley. So you can just Rick roll people from space or, you know, something clever like that. So if you build a CubeSat and you do that, please tell me because I would love to know and high five you. But that's all for this week's episode of The Art of Space Engineering. Thank you so much for tuning in and supporting this podcast. I really hope you enjoyed this interview. Check back every other week for more lessons learned related to space exploration. And if you've been enjoying this podcast and you want to support it, please share these episodes with your friends. And don't forget to follow this podcast on Facebook for additional updates. Here's looking forward to future adventures and the lessons learned from them. Cheers! Sarah.